And welcome to Thrift Shop Biography. This is the one about Dame Judy Dench. Thank you for listening. Hello. Hi. So you've been to the thrift shop this week and you picked up a really interesting bio- autobiography. I did. By? Judy Dench. Dame Judy Dench. Dame. She really is. We're not making that up this no, time. No, she's an actual yeah. dame. Yes. It says so in the book. It does. <laughs> Are you a fan of Dame Judy Dench? I am. She is a national treasure. She certainly loved is. Loved by all. I've seen her a few times. What, I've, what I've in theatre? The, in theatre. I've seen loads of the stuff she's in. Yeah. She's absolutely brilliant. What do you think of her? I don't like her. Ah, shut up. <laughs> Boo, get out. She plays everything the same. What? She's always Judy Dench. I thought you were joking. No. You don't like her? No, she bores me. Stop it. Look, I'm a bit torn because I really love her as a person. I think she's so charismatic and interesting. But she's one of our most treasured actors. Mm. And she plays every single role the same. Does she not do a Scottish accent? (laughs) Well, then she's just Judy Dench doing a Scottish accent. I don't even think the answer is no. (laughs) I don't think she does. Does she ever do Irish? But you can't just do a different accent. And and then, all right. Well, you know, that's getting into a deep conversation about acting. Yeah, no, I know. I get that. And I think a lot of people do that. Mm. They just are themselves. They are themselves. But they're totally channeling the character, but through them being themselves without having to check. Because you get a character actor or an actor. I just think an actor should... You should be able to watch a film or a theatre piece and not constantly think, oh, that's Judy Dench. Do you don't think you get lost in it when you're watching it and forget? No, I think it's Judy Dench. Really? Yeah. Oh, wait, okay. If you're talking about acting, you know my hero of acting is David Suchet. Yeah. Who plays Poirot. Yes. Agatha Christie's Poirot. And he's nothing like Poirot he, in he, real life. Yeah, he's nothing like him. He, he plays many things. I've seen him in many plays, all sorts of things. He's never remotely the same person twice. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. So, that's a good that's actor. And that's my hero I, of acting. Yeah. But he's a character actor and I get, when I see Judy Dench, especially, I got it through reading this book, her God is the writer. Her job, she talks about a lot, is to make sure the story is told as the writer wrote it. And she definitely does that. You go to see her in the theatre and that story is being told, that character has come to life because she's brought it to life exactly as it's written on the page. Even if she's not a character actor, so she's not suddenly Belgian detective or whatever, (laughs) she might still be Judy Dench telling you the story. The story is told immaculately through her. End of speech. Yeah, no, I'm not going (laughs) to argue with that. I guess I only have this issue with her because she is one of our most celebrated actors. Oh, yeah, and she's in so much. Yeah, and it's kind of like, well, can't she just be a bit better (laughs) at being different? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? If if that's what we're showing the world is a fantastic English actor, then she should try and walk with a limp some other time. (laughs) (laughs) So. That's, that's a debate about stars of acting. Also, before we get into yes. it, I'm calling her actor and she's an actress. What do we Yeah, think? well, it got dropped, the word actress, a while ago. But a lot of people still use it. Yeah, but I'm trying to do that, because why do you have to differentiate? It's a job. It is a job. You know, a plumber's a plumber. It's not a plumeress. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. But it was never a plumeress. No. Because women traditionally did not... Plum. Plum. <laughs> <laughs> but women did act... They did. So you would get actresses and actors. Yeah, but it's just a job. In the term of it, it's a job. You're an actor. I kind of get that. I don't mind that. I'm no, not, I get it. I'm not going to argue if you say actress. But then why but... Why did we come to the conclusion that actress was the word to lose? Why was that the demeaning word? Why didn't we get rid of the word actor? Why aren't we all actresses? I don't know if it's demeaning. It's just easier to just... Let's just no, I don't it think it is easier title. because we're discussing it right now. Yeah. I think it's confusing to people. I think it's confusing even people listening to this. If we refer to Judy Dench as an actor, they'll think, hang on, she's an actress. Why are you saying actor? Oh, OK. Well, she's an actor and an actress. She's both. She's she, very versatile. I actually, oh, I think it might even annoy her that we're even having this debate. Do you? Possibly. OK, shall we begin? Shall we? Can I just tell you something else I really don't like about yes. her? Yes. She's like a grown woman and she says mummy and daddy. I know. I uh, Yeah, some people do. Yeah, but do you find it irritating? I'm not a big fan of it in real life, but I know a lot of people do and I have to just get over it. Do you not form an opinion about that person? It does give you a sense that they haven't grown up properly. In her life, they have such a great relationship with their parents. I mean... Judy Dench and her husband, Michael Williams, to the point where they moved them all into the same house together. Oh, I love that. 
It's so bloody lovely. Yeah, I, no, I think that's lovely. But she, even within that, she doesn't have to call them mummy and daddy at the age of 45. I know, some people do. But look, Prince Charles mm. always said mummy. I know, but they're she weird. She was the queen and he I said know, mummy. That is one weird family. You can't compare <laughs> yeah, so, anybody but, to But it's comparable to what you're saying. It does feel a little bit childish. It's completely childish. Yeah. I'm trying not to judge it because some people just do. You know, oh, I'm they, judging not, it. Yeah, I'm judging you can. It. I'm, yeah. I'm not. I find it really weird. All right, you can have that. Anyway, so who were Judy Dench's mummy and daddy? <laughs> well, her dad was a doctor and her mum was a mum, but she also <laughs> did costumes. So cause they were really hot on the Amdram scene, amateur dramatics. And they were always doing theatre and plays. Her dad, as a doctor, sounds like such a laugh. Really great, always dressed up, always singing, dancing. Not and while he was family, treating people. I'd like to hope it was after work. <laughs> yeah, and then she's got two older brothers, Peter and Geoffrey, who Geoffrey definitely was an actor. Geoffrey definitely was. Geoffrey definitely was an actor. <laughs> what was Peter? Peter followed his dad into being a doctor who, right. liked, who liked dressing up. Yes. <laughs> and Jeff was an actor. Yeah. And that's who Judy went after. Yeah, she followed. I wonder how he felt. That he was the actor first and then little sister Judy just came and totally had the career. Beat him. Because yeah. Jeff Dench never heard that name. Oh, I have. Jeffrey Dench? Yes, definitely. Jeffrey, definitely Jeffrey? Yes. <laughs> yeah. How? Where? Well, he's an actor and I grew up in the actor world, didn't I? Yeah, you did. I'm going to say this officially. Yeah, go on. Because I always hint at it because Stratford on Avon comes up a lot. But I grew up in Stratford on Avon, yeah. land of Shakespeare. Land of the Royal Shakespeare Company, and I grew up going to the theatre, and my parents had seen all of this stuff. Geoffrey Dench was at the RSC a lot. He's a successful actor in his yes, own Yes, he right. is. And the thing is, is when you're at the Royal Shakespeare Company, the National, the Old Vic, all of that, you're really respected in, in the theatre world, but nobody knows who you are yeah. until you do a film. Mm-hmm. And only then, the age of about 54, when she did Shakespeare in Love, people start recognising her and yeah. applauding her in restaurants and stuff. Up to then, she's been a legend in the theatre world, yeah. but not a household name at all. Mm-hmm. And then the TV sitcoms obviously mm-hmm. changed things. Mm-hmm. So that's why you've never heard of Jeffrey Dench. She didn't do any of that other stuff. And if she hadn't, you wouldn't have heard of her either. Yeah. Well, not you might have, but most people wouldn't. You just don't reach people through theatre. Not, no, not you in don't. the same world. If you think there might be 500 people in a seats yeah. in a theatre and you're doing eight shows a week, you're reaching what, 4,000 people a week? It's nothing. It's a drop in the ocean. Yeah, you go on TV and your face is seen by yeah, millions. Yes. Yeah. Also, you can watch a play and you don't really remember who was in it yeah. necessarily. Mm-hmm. It's not the same. You, know, you see right up people's noses in the cinema, don't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so she follows her brother Jeff into the world of acting. Yeah, well, I was interested to know that she thought she might be a theatre designer. Oh, yeah. She yes. was interested in that. Mm-hmm. And she actually went to art school to do that. In that environment, they had a trip to Stratford to see... King Lear, with Michael Redgrave playing Lear. And it blew her mind, but it was the scenery that blew her mind because it was the 50s, so it was really stylized and really cool. Oh, and it was all transforming and slotting into, you know, it's really architectural. And she went, I can't do this, this is, this is too good. <laughs> yeah. And it put her off. So she went, oh, I'll be an actor instead. I'll be an actor, so that's much easier. Yeah, usually people get inspired because things are good and they want to... Emulate it, but she was put off by yeah, that. Yeah, intimidated. Yeah. She thought, I could do acting. It's much easier. I could just be myself in every role I play. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it was a good decision on her behalf. It paid off. Yeah. Yeah. So she studied at the Central School of Speech and Drama. Yes, which was housed at the Albert Hall. I never knew you could go to drama school at the Albert Hall, oh. ever. Amazing, hey? And so they all lived right around there, right in Kensington, South Kensington. 60 years ago, yeah. London was a different place. You That's could true. afford to live in Kensington if you were a student, yeah, you know? Yeah, exactly. Now it's such a billionaire's oh, pad. Yeah. It is hard to imagine that London used to be an accessible city once yeah, upon yeah. a time for the arts. Yeah. Also, note, I have to say billionaire's area now because million, yeah. million wouldn't even get you anywhere yeah. around there. So it's interesting actually you think about all of the places like Brixton and Hackney which have been gentrified which weren't such great areas and now you know there's artists and bakeries on point, every corner yeah. you don't think of Kensington actually having the same upgrade because it was a nice area to begin with yeah. well actually what it means it's gone from millionaires to billionaires it is. now it's like oil rich around yeah. there so she did well at drama school mm. But don't you find it amazing that when she literally did her showcase at the end of training, that she was picked up straight away? Yeah. 
And not just picked up straight away, but picked up and then... And put in the old Vic Hamlet as Ophelia. I mean, that's insane. Yeah, it is, but you do need young people in some of these parts. <laughs> True. So you kind of have to pluck them out of yeah. drama school. But the talent... Talent! She actually had it. Oh, do you know what? She undoubtedly has the talent, but it's also... She does have that charisma she that George... She has a lovely voice. She's beautiful. She kind of has it, or she's not like traditionally beautiful, but she does have something very compelling, actually. And I can Mm. imagine if you are a talent scout at a drama school showcase, I can imagine how Mm. she would have stood out, actually. Mm. Yeah, I get it. And she does refer to herself quite a few times as a dwarf. (laughs) But she is really small. And she does have a childlike quality, even now. So she is... So you cast her as some of these parts... She'd seem even younger than she yeah. is, which is good for a lot of these parts. Like Juliet. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Because she was playing Juliet when she was like 25, I yeah. think. Yeah. I really think she is beautiful. She's who I'd always hold up as, this is why you shouldn't have plastic surgery. You can see a whole life in that face and she's still beautiful. That's amazing to still be alive and have lived. That's a beauty that's so much nicer to me than a mask. I also think you. it's kind of... Essential to acting, it, really. It is essential. How can you... Yeah, unless you're playing somebody who lives in Beverly Hills and yeah. might have had a face Yeah, fair enough. Thing, but yeah. that's going to limit you. I think it's kind of typically English. When you think about our leading actors of that mm. generation, Judy Dench, Maggie Smith, Helen Mirren, Penelope Wilton, Imelda Staunton, all so of them, many. none of them have had no, you, extensive yeah. plastic surgery. No, you're right, you can't. And when you think about the American people of the same age, they kind of all have. Well, actually, a lot, you know, like, think of Nicole Kidman, so I know she's Australian, but her face was stretched from the age of, like, 40. Yeah. And when you see her, I mean, she's has this very cool exterior, but it's almost yeah. because she can't move her I know, face. and I have to say, this is another tangent, but Jane Fonda, I'm finding very disappointing. Having read her book... Yes. And then now seeing that she's playing these 80-year-olds, and it's great. There are these women, and they're strong, and they're out there at 80, but she's got a smooth that face. Yeah. It's just like... So disappointing. I'm so proud of people like Judy Dench and Maggie Smith who just wear their life on their yeah. face and they're still beautiful. And you don't have to be beautiful, but they are. Yeah. And so's Helen Mirren. Yeah, I'm so proud of them for sticking to their humanity, to tell us stories that are real. Thanks, women. Anyway. <laughs> She's barely been born. She was born in 1934, by the way, I'm going to throw that in. 1934? In York, which is up north, but she's not northern. She's not northern. Well, she doesn't it, seem northern. But you wouldn't know because she, she has that actor's voice. She probably had drama yeah. schooled out. So Judy Dench is proper northerner. They just yeah. beat her out of her at drama school. Yeah, that's right. Can I leap to Yeah. when she did Macbeth with Ian McKellen in 1974? They did it at the other place in Stratford, which is like a shed. They really asked to do this. They said, we want to do this mm. play and we want to do it small. It's up the road from the main theatre... And it was a shed, literally built as a shed. It's like the Eiffel Tower. It was only supposed to be temporary. It has a um, corrugated iron roof. And when it rained, the rain came in. When it snowed, the snow came in. <laughs> it was 150 seats. Can you imagine Judy Dench and McKellen in 74? They were legends of the theatre. It was so intense, right? It was so legendary. My parents saw it. Did they? Yeah, knocked them out. There's a place in Stratford where you can go to Shakespeare Institute. And they've recorded for posterity every single production ever since they invented the camera. And you can go ask to watch anything and they'll get it out of the archives and you can sit in a booth there and watch it. So I did that. I thought, I'm gonna, I am gonna. I want to see this legendary production. So I actually sat in that booth and watched it. Oh, my God, the acting. Like, when she finds out that... Oh, I can't remember what which bit it is, but she, like, howls out of mourning, this, this grief... She's like howling, but no sounds coming out. And then this distant wailing's coming out of her mouth. And you're like, oh, my God, it's intense. If you were in that room, it's electric. That has got to be the best production of Macbeth that's ever Mm. been performed. And it talks about it a little bit in this. It says it couldn't quite get it. And then they said to Ian McKellen, if you come in at the back of the room and walk down through the audience to the stage and you imagine the audience are all asleep and you're coming in having killed the king, that's when they got it. So they actually use the audiences that people in the castle in their minds. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, it's intense. That's the sort of experience you can get from people who are this good at their job. 100% embodying these characters. 
and you're in a room with them. Unbelievable. That's what makes her legendary and Ian McKellen and all these people. So the old Vic took a massive risk casting mm. her as Ophelia and it worked. Yeah, she was they a hit in the papers. And so that kind of started a period where she got to play loads of different Shakespeare characters, right? <laughs> and it never stopped. Yeah. Pretty much never stopped. This book is almost a list from that point on of everything she's ever done. Yeah, this book kind of, it doesn't really go into the detail an awful lot it's just about every single role she played and how much fun it was or if it wasn't yeah yeah of course you know when she's playing all of these Shakespeare parts she's immersed in these companies where they play all the different plays and even when she's not on the stage performing she stood at the side of the stage watching and learning so even as a young actress in the industry now she's learning Shakespeare inside out she's almost becoming an encyclopedia of Shakespeare herself and I guess Mm. that's what makes her like you just said about her and Ian McKellen Mm. an amazing channel for Shakespeare's verse you know she really understands she really does doesn't she and she says years later she really enjoys teaching it and passing on what she knows and stuff yeah Oh, I love knowledge. that she goes on little tangents in this book, just imparting her knowledge. Like, if you were, right, yeah. if anybody is listening who wants to be an actor or an actress, yeah. <laughs> or is even remotely interested in the theatre industry, she doesn't go into it a lot, but there are certain little sections of this book which I think are really encouraging and inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but she also says, don't do it if you don't have an abundance of energy. Yeah. Because it's exhausting. And I really get that from this. She is a real energetic little sprightly little person. But because she seems to be quite fortunate in getting that amazing break from her drama school Mm. showcase, she basically goes into a career of endless jobs most of the time. So she can have that energy because she's not a jobbing actor trudging to auditions and getting rejected. That's true, actually. That's true. So her energy that most actors... doing eight shows a week. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's actually doing the job. Yeah, most actors, just their energy (laughs) is constantly (laughs) reduced by constant rejection. Actually, that's true. So she's just very fortunate that she gets to do that. But hey, also, like when she's joined the old Vic... John Gilgood, Sir John Gilgood oh, was yes. there. And he really took her oh, under yeah. his wing and really taught her really important things about acting and verse. This is after you've got trained. It's like you've done your degree, then you get your master's yeah. because you're working with master's and they're passing on their knowledge. Mm-hmm. She apprenticed while being Ophelia. <laughs> it's yeah, amazing, right. isn't it? Yeah. So being a Stratford girl, do you um, love Shakespeare? I do. I mean, Zoe Wanamaker crops up a lot. She's done a lot with her. My first Shakespeare I remember was Twelfth Night, and I was in the stalls. My dad was sat next to the aisle. He's got very long legs. And Zoe Wanamaker came up the aisle. She was Viola in Twelfth Night. She came up the aisle. Her dress was rubbing against my dad, so I could have touched it. And she was talking back up to the stage from next to us, and it blew my mind. How old would you have been? Maybe six. Wow. I was like, oh, my God. That was my moment where I went, oh, my God, this is amazing. These people are real people. And this is happening, like, here, around mm-hmm. us. From that moment on, I was in. Do you like Shakespeare? No, it's boring. Yeah! <laughs> if I... you see it done well, that's the thing. If no, this is my badly, argument. it'll kill you. Yes. No, this is my argument about Shakespeare. So few people do it well these days. And I think I just had a run of badly done ones. Mm. And it can. It can kill your love for Shakespeare. I've studied Shakespeare when you actually get into the language and mm. analyse that text and stuff. Oh, my God, it's so amazing. you just got to see, like, three bad Shakespeare's in a row and it just One, kills I think. <laughs> a lot of people go with school and it kills them. But the thing is, is if you see Shakespeare by people who understand every single word, if they understand it, you will. Even if you don't understand every other word, if yeah. they understand what they're saying, yes. you will understand their meaning without yeah. having to know the language yeah. entirely. Yeah. And that's why... These people can do it because they've been indulged in it, really. Yeah. And the most productions won't get this sort of training. They won't have done it for years. They won't have the rehearsal time to have understood every single word they're saying. Mm-hmm. And it will, yeah, it will kill you. Yes. It's got make or break, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's such a shame how many people are put off it by bad productions. Yeah. Um, Frankie Howard. Yeah, Frankie Howard. So she's in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Yeah. And Frankie Howard is bottom. It's great. But kind of reading between the lines, I think he sounds like a bit of an arsehole. Yeah, 
He, he wouldn't pay for a drink. I hate that. He was I too think... tight. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a really bad measure of a person if they won't get around to drinks, and yeah. especially if they're famous. He was probably the most wealthy of the yeah, lot of them. Yeah, of course them. he was. But that's not the point anyway. If, if yeah. everyone's getting rounds in, which is very much our yeah. culture in Britain, he was always last to the pub, yeah. so he wouldn't have to get around in. So one <laughs> night they all were hanging around outside his dressing room. He's going, what's going on? It's all right, we're waiting for you. And he, he couldn't believe it. Yeah. He had to go in first. Yeah. But then they said that night when he's the first to get into the pub, he actually stopped to tie his shoelaces <laughs> so they would have to walk past him so he wouldn't have to buy a round. It's bad. Yeah, really bad, actually. Yeah, anyway. I've heard other things about him that he's not the greatest person yeah. who ever if that, lived. If that's the only story she's telling about him. Yeah. Then, yeah, you do wonder. Anyway, and then the big one is she got to be Juliet with Franco Zeffirelli directing. Yes. A very young cast, and like you say, she did look young because they are supposed to be 14, but it really sounds like she nailed that. Well, to the point where um, they were taking it to Turin and then touring it and going on to Broadway. Yeah. But then she didn't go because she was moving from the old Vic to the Royal Shakespeare Company. Yeah. Franco Zeffirelli was furious that she didn't go to Broadway, and she says he didn't speak to her for 40 years. Yeah. Yeah, that's harsh. His loss. (laughs) So in 1961, she joined the Royal Shakespeare Company. Yeah, she's in a a lot of plays. (laughs) Yeah, but she's also one thing people don't know about the Royal Shakespeare Company. They don't just do Shakespeare. No, they don't. They do Chekhov and other boring stuff. Other things. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, Ian Holm was in things with her. What is he? Little Lord of the Rings fellow. Ian McShane as well. Yes. Love Joy. Is everybody called Ian? Ian McKellen, Ian Holm, Ian McShane. Yes. Interesting. The, all of these actors had the similar career. Yeah. Like, for years, they would they just, just theatre. They just theatre. That's right. What's interesting about this is Judy Dench did have a couple of roles on TV. You know when they used to yeah. record plays on a Yeah, it's set. very theatre on telly, though, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. She doesn't really talk about it at all. It's just something that yeah, happens. Yeah, she skips over it. So they are actually on TV, but only a for bit. a niche audience, yeah. an arts audience, it is who really. might want to watch that at half past ten on Tuesday night on BBC yeah. Two. Exactly, yeah, it doesn't reach people TV. in the same yeah. way. Yeah. And Ian yeah. McKellen did as well, right? Yeah, true. But of course, yeah. because the industry is changing, they're in yeah. it almost from the beginning of TV. They are, stuff. actually. Yeah, they yeah. really are. Yeah, mm. that's true. Yeah, but they were in this play called The Twelfth Hour with Ian McKellen and Ian McShane when Hal Prince came to see it and then cast her in Cabaret as Sally Bowles. Yes. Let's talk about Sally Bowles. Yeah, that's really cool, isn't it? Because she is not Liza Minnelli. She's not. But Liza Minnelli kind of disrupted that character, didn't she? A lot of people thought at the time that Judi Dench should have got cast in the film and it was really unfair that she got replaced. Because she nailed it and got the, all the nuances of that character. I, mean, I think she should have been English as well, I feel. An English person in... It doesn't really matter, but it would have been amazing to see that. She was. This yeah. is my understanding of Cabaret and the character of Sally Bowles. Sally Bowles should not be a good singer That's and dancer. That's right. Right? Yes, and Liza Millie's obviously fantastic. Yeah. You need to be able to act the emotions in it mm-hmm. without having to be a musical theatre mm-hmm. voice. So the reason Judy Dench kind of excelled in that role is because she wasn't a brilliant yes. singer or dancer. And I think there's a current production of Cabaret now, right? And in fact, you were at the Olivier Awards, weren't you? Yes. And when the woman who's playing Sally Bowles at the moment come out to sing Life is a Cabaret... They're taking it back to the original intention that Sally Bowles is not a fantastic singer, even though that singer is a fantastic she singer. Is, yeah. She's singing it like she's not always hitting yeah. the notes up. Now, on social media, because that was televised, right. on social media, people ripped her apart. Oh, no. They said, how did this woman get to play Sally Bowles? It's just like, oh, you're not understanding but that's, that's why the you original shouldn't... intention. Yes, but... but that's why it's dangerous to say things out of context. Oh, yeah, just yeah. coming on and yes. singing that one yeah. song. Yeah. But Liza Minnelli made that role almost too perfect, right? Yeah, I mean, she was, I mean, it's amazing though, isn't it? Yeah, no, yes. I guess you can, there's room for different interpretations, but it's almost a shame they didn't film her version. Yeah. So at the end of 1969, mm. Twelfth Night, from the RSC, they toured it to Japan and Australia. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's the time where she got together with Michael Williams. Before they that, they'd yeah. been in the same sort of, sort of circles for nine years. And then they started having a few drinks at Dirty Duck and he flew to Australia to visit for a week. 
And then stayed for six weeks because mm-hmm. they just hit it off and they were inseparable ever since. Yeah. It's so lovely because they got married and then did a lot of plays together, which is so nice that people cast them together because they're both brilliant. And mm-hmm. then they got to actually spend time together, which is great. So this, we're at the moment, we're around the early 1970s at this point, right? Yeah. So Michael Williams and Judy Dench are getting together and they both have these brilliant theatre careers. And then they have a little baby in 1972 called Finty. Yeah. And then they got the house together with their parents. Yes. And they all lived together very happily. Oh, they did Merchant of Venice together. And she said there's a speech in it where she's supposed to say, to stay you from election, that one night she said erection by accident. (laughs) She lost it. Everyone lost it. There's so many stories about her laughing and misbehaving. She lost it. And she just left the stage. The <laughs> band who were on the stage all upped and left the stage. All the other actors walked off the stage because everyone had, was crying, basically. <laughs> she said, it was terrible. <laughs> I love that the band walked off. There's a lot of, um, loads of that, isn't stories there? of high jinks and jokes yeah. between the theatre company. Oh, I love this. Her and John Mills were in this play together and there was an actor who kept looking down at the orchestra pit when he was acting. Like, not at the audience, but down addressing the orchestra pit. And he was just an idiot. So then they, uh, there was a scene where they all had to walk on. It sounds like it was really choreographed. Pick up suitcases and then swing them up because it was like an intersection at a train station. So they put two stage weights in his suitcase. So he walks on, grabs it to swing it up and fell flat on the floor. And then later in the same scene, when everyone's strolling by, he's pushing his suitcase across the stage. Oh, it's so good. Why do you find them all so funny? It's hilarious. (laughs) I like how funny you find these stories are, because when I was reading all these stories, I was kind of like, I think I kind of had to be there. But you were getting really enjoyment out of it. I was there. Yeah. (laughs) I pitched it completely. Good. And there's another one where she says uh, they were doing Mother Courage and everyone has to come to her cart. And imagine it's all rural, rustic rags and stuff. And they all have to come to her cart to buy a beer or something. And they're paying in stage coins. And one matinee, they all got credit cards. (laughs) I'm imagining the audience can't see. So then the next day she puts vinegar in their beer. So they're all taking swigs at the same time. And there's this spray in the air (laughs) as they all sprayed out... (laughs) <laughs> the trick would be to not lose it whilst playing these jokes. Yeah. Just keeps them going, doesn't it? When you're repetitively doing like imagine a year in the same show, eight shows a week. You've got to do something. I think was it Mother Courage? She said some actor walked across the stage from a totally different play because they're all at the National or the RSC. You're sharing the backstage with the other theatres that back on. She would do that. This really surprised she me. Did it, if yeah. she had, I can't remember what play it, it started of, she because someone else did it. Right. So if she's in the National Theatre in a massive play and then she's got like half an hour off yeah. stage, she would get so bored that she would talk to the other company. And they would give her a costume yeah. and she would get to walk on in the background <laughs> of another show. play going on at the National. Yeah, That's yeah. mad. She said she walked on in a play in the West End, I think. She said she actually had time to run across to a different theatre and walked on it. They told her which scene to be in and to do this. She was doing it behind an actor that she was trying to throw off, but he didn't even look round. <laughs> And she was like, this is ridiculous. I'm dressed as a pirate. He hasn't even seen me. <laughs> and then she didn't know how to get off. And then she also was in Les Mis. She organised it, so she got the costume, she went on, she got shot and died, (laughs) and then didn't know how to get off. (laughs) She said that when she heard the gunshot, she made this big thing of, like, yelling and falling to the floor, because they forgot to tell her that she only got shot in the arm. (laughs) Yeah, so she could have walked herself off, and she'd fall on the floor, and then was like... Oh no! How, how do I get off stage? <laughs> oh. I'm fascinated by that. Actually, that you could just be sat yeah. in a theatre in the West End and not know that one of the extras is Judy Dench, yeah. who just exactly. has half an hour free because she's in a play across the yeah, road. Exactly. That's amazing. Are we getting to cats? Cats. Okay, cats. Cats. She's got a job in cats. It was really unusual for her to do this sort of thing: dancing, singing. Meowing. It was really pushing the boundaries. She was loving it. And then she broke her, tore her. What did she do? She injured herself. She hurt her leg. Yeah. 
She does say how clumsy she is. She falls over all the time. But it was a serious enough injury to take yeah. her out of production. They really went forward mm. accommodating her injury, mm. hoping that she would get better for mm. opening night, and it just didn't happen. So in the end, she was desperately upset that she yeah. couldn't do it. But they tried everything and to keep her included. They wanted her in it. Yeah, they tried everything they could, but they didn't. And then they drafted in... Elaine Page. There you go. That was a it's, role which elevated her, right? Yeah, it's kind of a crossroads of the musical theatre world because Elaine Page is now Elaine Page. Yeah. And she's so legendary for doing Cats. That was what brought her to the yeah. main. Of course, she was a brilliant theatre actor in her own right. voice, of course. Yeah, and she got top ten with that memory. That was, was memory yeah, was it was from memory, Cats, right? Yeah, it was her. So, basically, Judy Dench... <laughs> Hurting her leg. Invented Pushed Elaine Page. Elaine Page's yeah, 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 yeah. It really did. And it didn't hurt her. She carried on being Judy Dench. An interesting thing of that crossroads is if Judy Dench hadn't hurt her leg, yeah. then would she be a massive musical theatre star? I don't now? think so. No. I think how Elaine Page sang memory is why it was so yeah. memorable. <laughs> <laughs> So then she gets offered to play Cleopatra, coming at you, yes. in Antony and Cleopatra, but by two directors at the same time. Yes. Right? Yeah, and she says yes to both people. To Peter Hall. Yes. And... Terry Hans. Who are both RSC. Yes. Why would the RSC be doing two versions of Antony and Cleopatra? Oh, no. One of, they weren't both at the RSC. Oh, OK. But they, they were both directors from the RSC. One of them would have been somewhere else. I can't remember where, though. Okay, anyway, so she kind of said yes to both... But she kind of said, oh, yes, well, no, that would be marvellous. No, in a way, it sounded yes. like she said it like that. Like you do. And they went and programmed the seasons yeah. both with her. Yeah, like the way you would talk, oh, that would be amazing, I'd love to do that. Yeah. yeah, but then she said to Terry, she said, sorry, Terry, I did promise it to Peter first. And then Terry said, yes, but that was at a party. It wasn't in an office. It wasn't a proper offer. Oh. I mean, that's a real dilemma now for yeah. her. So they both... She's going to upset someone. Both of these esteemed directors have both offered her the job at Cleopatra at the same time, and they both think that she's going to do it. Yeah. Fuck, that's difficult that's to bad. get out of. So what did happen? She did Peter Hall's in the end. It was Anthony Hopkins playing Anthony. She said uh, that every time he had to die in her arms, she carried on and did the fifth act without him because he was dead. And every time he was dying in her arms, he'd say things like, oh, I'm going to have a nice cup of tea now. When you carry on and do Act 5, I'm going to have a nice cup of tea in the dressing room. <laughs> Are you watching that? You have no idea. That's actually what someone's mumbling in their death mumble. <laughs> so then she became a dame mm. in the mid-80s, right? Yeah. I didn't realise that. So she was She's massively accomplished. Yeah. So you can become a dame just by being a brilliant theatre actor. Yeah, actor, definitely. Even though you're not in James Bond yet. Yeah, she's offered her life for the stage. Okay, and of course, like you say, Prince Charles was a regular visitor to Stratford, right? Ah, he's right? mad for it. It so is he... the Royal Shakespeare Company. Yeah. And the Royal National Theatre it was then. So he totes knew who they're, Judy they're was. They're the top of their game of yeah. our country's theatre, which is considered pretty up there in the world. So he, he bestowed the date with the British Empire upon yeah. Judy Dench. Yeah. Quite right. Oh, I've got another jape. Right, I've got to mention this one, it's really good. She's in Importance of Being Earnest playing Lady Bracknell and um, Martin Jarvis is in it and he plays a prank on Nigel Havers. He's famous for being really nice. Yeah. <laughs> and Martin Jarvis taped the sound of the audience coming in. <laughs> it's yeah, good, isn't it? It's yeah. good. And then he changed all the clocks in the dressing room and then he played the tape of the audience coming in. Nigel Havers is getting ready, but he's way off being ready. And he suddenly looks and goes, oh, bloody hell, you know. And he, he says he's ripping his curlers out, throwing them everywhere, runs under the stage from the dressing room. It's quite a way to the stage. He has to run all the way under the stage and up the stairs and round and runs onto the stage and the safety curtain's in and all the cast are still on the stage <laughs> laughing at him. <laughs> he's in a total panic. That's a good one, isn't it? It is a good one, but I hope he saw the funny side, because otherwise that's bullying in the workplace. I tell you, he's still in Panto to this day, is every he? year at the London Palladium, and they totally sort of bully him all the time in that. Oh, do he, they? he comes on, they go, Nigel, you're not on yet. Nigel, this, you're not in this no, scene. No, that's fucking with his head at that point. They, he, they, they do it every year, I go and see it every year, and that's the joke. It's always a joke I thought the Nigel joke Havers. is like tormenting Nigel Havers. How yes. old is he now? <laughs> I don't know, like 70 eight, something. 18. You can't confuse an old man, that's horrible. <laughs> no, no, but it's part of the script. 
Oh. Yeah, they do script it so in. So they're humiliating him yes. in front of the audience. It's obviously a running theme that goes way back to the beginning of his career. <laughs> Poor Nigel Hayward. I, I feel bad for him. He's made a though. career of it. Anyway, then she gets a, a fine romance, the sitcom. Never uh, watched it, did you? No, there's two sitcoms. What was the other one as time goes by? Which, Which is the one first. with Jeffrey? They both are. Oh right! It's the same. It's essentially the same sitcom. Oh. a bit later, and they retitled oh, as time goes it by, like so Sex and the City and the, oh. whatever they call it now. I watched one episode just to see what it was all about, and there was a nice rapport between them. But I really remember Lionel. Is he called the the, the bloke? His her right, husband. Right. Yeah. Banging his head in frustration against the wall in their home, the wall wobbling a bit. Yeah. And I noticed there was a makeup mark. <laughs> Oh, After really? he walked away from it. <laughs> so it's kind of primitive early TV yeah. where it was like really theatre. Yeah. And that's literally my only memory of that. It wasn't for me. Yeah, I never it watched it. It was a very dad, middle guess. class, older yeah. people. Yeah, we were into the young ones and stuff like that at that point, weren't we? I guess so. Yeah, we wouldn't have watched it. No, it wasn't yeah. for us. But it definitely got her face on the TV regularly. Yeah, it got her known. Yeah. Completely by the And I, li- I like the fact that there, to this day there is like this mad internet fan club of that show yeah. who fly from all over the world to see her perform in the theatre. Yeah, and actually really nice. when they come, she'll take time after the show and spend the rest of the evening with them and yeah. sign autographs and stuff. So it, it wasn't for us, but there are people who love yeah. that show. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, this is when there were three channels on TV, so it would have had an audience of millions, actually. Yes, exactly. So she worked with a very young Sam Mendes, yeah. right, in a play at the end of the 80s, or was it the beginning of the 90s? Anyway, he was directing her in, in Chichester, and she found out much, because he was 23 at 23. the time. 23. And she's a dame of the British Empire. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And she said she found out later that he was really nervous about directing her, and she says there was, like, literally no inkling that he was yeah. nervous at all. I love this. So I said to him once in rehearsal... I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try something else. And he said, well, you can if you want, but it won't work. And he turned his back and refused to watch. I mean, the audacity of that at the age of 23, directing Judy Dench. That's nuts. It's really rude. Really rude. <laughs> yeah. But he went on to become one of the most successful yeah. British directors of all time. What did he do? He's done everything. So in order to be a massively successful director, you just have to be Rude really to a legend rude. when you're 23. Yeah. And everyone off. respects you, apparently. Yeah. No, he's good at his job. He's really good. She did Ibsen's Ghosts with Kenneth Branagh on television in 1985. And that's how they became mates. Ah, OK. And they did play quite a big part in each other's lives after that. He drafted her into his Renaissance theatre company, which he invented in 1988. And he put that together. Oh, he wrote an autobiography at that time to earn enough money to fund that theatre. Because yes. I've read that around that time. That autobiography was his early life in Belfast, in the Troubles and the IRA and everything, and then moving to London. That's what now recently the, the film Belfast, Belfast came out. Yeah. So it would be based on that. Mm-hmm. He had mm-hmm. a story to tell. Mm-hmm. And he's a good writer, and he's just such an enigmatic man. He's also amazingly good at Shakespeare, and he absolutely loved it. So they, they obviously got on very well. She directed. He got her to direct. Much Ado About Nothing. Yeah, and she said being interested in design really helped because, you you know, as a director, you have to think of the whole picture and she could see it in pictures, which is what good directors do. Well, I like it when that happens. But it was, sounded really traumatic, her directing, because she couldn't let it go. And then they'd all crack up laughing all the time and she'd be livid. And then she'd go, oh, my God, that's what I've done my whole life. Yeah, How annoying right. that is for a yeah. director. She says that actors would come in and say, oh, I worked on it all last night. And she'd absolutely know they were lying. And she knows because she'd have said it. She knows too much. Yeah. She was like, never again will I lie to a director and say I worked on something all night because it's so obvious. And and then also as a director, she'd have the experience of everyone going to the pub without her and how isolating it is being mm-hmm. a director. So she ended up directing three things and then was like, actually, interesting experience. Yeah, but didn't want to do any more. You don't have yeah. as much fun. No, I imagine no it's way. terrible directing. Yeah. Much better to yeah. be an actor. It is. You have to really want to be a director. Yeah. If you're an actor, yeah. you want to be an actor. They are such different things. Oh, it's such completely different mindset yeah, and discipline, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Well, anyway. She had a go. I don't think it was terrible. Did you see any of them? No. They were terrible. <laughs> <laughs>
So Judy has decades of being a brilliant theatre yeah. actor. Oh, hang on. No, she does a little night music. Yeah, she does a little night music. She'd already <laughs> met Stephen Sondheim in a swing pool. Remember when she got flown out to someone's house? I think it was Hal Prince after the cat's debacle. And she was introduced to Steve in the swimming pool. Didn't know it was Steve and Sondheim. And so they've been mates for years. So it's really nice she got to be in a little night music, which is legendary, a legendary production at, at the National. And really made Send in the Clowns. Again, not being a singer. This is the yeah. thing about the Sally Bowles coming back. Yeah. So Send in the... I would say the definitive version of Send in the Clowns it is, is Judy Dent. Yeah, because she really acted it and emoted it. Yeah. Sold it. That yeah. completely has gone into history. It is. Yeah, yeah, they did a big Stephen Sondheim thing in the West End celebrating him last year. And she came on to do that. Because even so like she... Barbara Streisand's even done Send in the Clowns, right? Isn't that amazing that yeah. Judy Dench is considered the definitive version yeah. when Barbara Streisand she has done it? Acted it. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, so that was a big hit. And then. Then she's now finally. Well, not finally, because I don't think she ever really sought film roles, but she's getting offered film roles. And the first major one is Mrs. Brown, mm. which they didn't think was going to be a massive film. They thought it was something that was just being filmed for the BBC. Yeah, that's and right. Billy Connolly. I don't know who he is. I've never seen it. So she's Queen Victoria, oh, right? I've seen it. Yeah, she's Queen Victoria. It was after her husband had died. She was very lonely. And there was this man who just worked for her. And he might have been the horse trainer. I can't remember who he was, but he was not aristocracy. They was get he Mr. Brown? He was called Mr. Brown. Okay. And they fell in love, according to this film, and maybe according to facts. But uh. they never did anything about it. It was just a real platonic bond of the heart that actually got her through her later years and got her through her grief. Mm -hmm. And it's a lovely, lovely film. She's out riding all the time and they're out on horses. So, of course, you get Billy Connolly to play him yeah. with his big beard. Of course, Billy Connolly, being a comedian, is a hilarious, an amazing, witty, intelligent man. And you can only imagine the laughs they had together. Oh, yeah. And well, they, they said that get... they, they were on horses a lot and they said the horses kept farting. Yeah. And she said they laughed so much that in one scene they just had to use a scene where they're laughing. She said, if you watch the film carefully, there's a scene where they're riding off together on the horses and you can just see their shoulders going <laughs> yeah. up and yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. So. I bet they barely got through a single day's filming. But also, don't forget, that was a massive revelation that Billy Connolly could do straight acting. That's like true. Because that. he was just a comedian. That's very true, time. yeah. And it's just a wonderful pairing because they did bond so much. Mm -hmm. And so their love comes through. And it's, then, it's so they film. just thought it was going to be this little film that was going to go out on the BBC. And then as they were filming it, I think the producers and stuff said, no, this needs to go out this into the special. cinemas. It needs yeah. a theatrical release, which ended up on Judy Dench getting nominated for a Best Actress Oscar. Yeah, and it's very exciting. It's really exciting for her, having just really been a, a jobbing actor, a successful jobbing actor, to get this whole new world because she says they do it in a way that nothing ever is, touches it in Britain. There's the glamour and the money and everything. And she really hasn't had much of that or any of that in her life. So this is a big deal. She gets put in clothes by designers and well, given jewellery you know and stuff. That, like people were offering her dresses. I think it was Donatella Versace and Zandra Rhodes, but she went with Nicole Fari oh. because Nicole Fari is David Hare's wife. Did you know that? It says it in this book, but I had no idea. I had no idea. No. I find that the oddest thing that David mm. Hare's married to Nicole Fari. I think he doesn't come across as that interesting. Well, he shouldn't. He's a writer. Yeah. His work needs yeah, to speak yeah. for himself. Yeah. It's like, it's like um, Arthur Miller marrying Marilyn Monroe, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, not quite. No, not. <laughs> nothing like that. Anyway, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Now, here's another thing. When, at the Oscar ceremony, her and Helena Bonham Carter were asked to do a skit yeah. where they're both dressed up as builders and they have to swear a lot. It sounds hilarious. I looked for it on the internet. No trace of it whatsoever. Huh. I didn't film I'd love to see then. that. Yeah. What's mad about that is that she never thought... She thought she had no future in the world of film because back in the days of the old Vic, she went for a screen test yeah. for some screen work and she said, this man, having looked at me for a long time, said, well, Miss Dench, I have to tell you that you have every single thing wrong with your face. So I just very quietly got up and left and thought there's no point in going on with this. Yeah. 
So that's why she never really tried yeah. to audition for screen work at yeah, all. Yeah. And she just stayed in the theatre until she got to the point where she was so respected, people were throwing film roles at her. Yeah. And even then, when she's doing films, she still goes back to the theatre all the time because she loves it. She really yeah. does Oh, love yeah. It. No, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. She's around 50 as well. Yeah, right. So she actually takes off in film at around 50. Mm-hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, very. Just because of the Hollywood world... Your career's over if you're 25. Yes. She takes off at 50. This is why you don't get surgery, people. <laughs> get surgery. <laughs> and then what happened next? She got more film. Yeah. Shakespeare in Love is next. What's interesting about Shakespeare in Love is that she's playing Queen Elizabeth mm. the first, mm. and she's not on screen for that long. Eight minutes, she says. But she's nominated for Best Supporting Actress at the Oscars and... Drum roll. Drum roll. The winner is Judy <laughs> Dench. Woo, woo, woo. It's wins. amazing. Yeah. For eight minutes. That's a powerful eight minutes. Do you know what, though? Also, I from reading these books like Kirk Douglas, who was nominated three times, um, but Betty Davis, all of these people, I do get now that a lot of people winning Oscars is not necessarily to do with the film that they were in that they were nominated for. It's more about it being their time mm. to be rewarded. Do you think? Yeah, I think there were a lot of people who probably thought she should have won for Mrs. Brown. I, oh, and she didn't yes, win. Yes. And then so when she comes up again, oh, they think, oh, do you know what? I want her to win because she was brilliant in Mrs. Brown. Because it's eight minutes. I'd have to watch it again to see just how unbelievably amazing that eight minutes was. You can convey so much in film in, without even speaking in a second. Yeah. Well, it okay. might have been amazing. Well, we need to see who else she was nominated against. Yeah. Oh, the Oscars is rubbish anyway. Well, uh, but it's anyway. just millionaires patting other millionaires on yeah. the back, isn't it? She had another amazing time. Oh, and she bought the set. Yeah, she so bought the theatre. So for that film, they yeah. recreated... It wasn't the Globe, what is it called? The Rose. Yeah, the Rose Theatre. Yeah. They recreated the Rose Theatre, Shakespeare's Theatre, the Rose Theatre... For the film set, and at the end of filming, she bought it. Yeah, and it's in storage somewhere to this day. And Maggie Smith often says, oh, be careful, Judy will buy the set. But I love that. It's a lovely that. thing to do. I actually love that she kept that yeah. for posterity, yeah. and it is there somewhere. Yeah. And at any point, it can be brought yeah, it's out. it's great. Yeah. So she's getting with other films, like Tea with Mussolini, with Cher, and Maggie Smith was yeah, in that, right? Yeah, She doesn't say much about that, other than they've no. chipsing around looking for a new hotel. Yeah, that's You know, there's right. tiny yeah. stories about yeah. this, but then there's a hell of a lot to get through. Charles Dance directed her and Maggie Smith in uh, Ladies in Lavender, Ladies which I watched Lavender. that as well. I tend Did to you? watch things with Judy Dench in, because I like her. And I know it's going to be quality, and know it's going to be good. And Maggie Smith, they're just great. Yeah. They're great actors. There's always going to be so much in there, like little looks between people, you know, that extra stuff they do. Mm -hmm. There's always that. And I mean, then she gets offered the role of M in the Bond films. Which is legendary. I mean, just it actually kind of brought it out of the Dark Ages in many ways. Like she actually says, I loved saying that sentence, you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. Yeah. It, just that one sentence almost heaved it out of the Dark Ages. I remember her saying that sentence and I mm. thought, wow, yeah, it changes Bond, actually. Mm. It's inspired casting mm. to put an older woman as M. She was absolutely brilliant. She also said the only reason she could have got that job is because there was finally a woman in a high-up position in MI5. Stella Remington. Yeah. It had to take times actually changing for mm -hmm. you to actually be able to believable that she was in that role. What does she say? She got drunk with the power of that part. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, you know, controlling everything. Oh, yeah. Oh, she just said that was one of the hardest things. It's just like pretending that she knew how to control this room with all the moving screens <laughs> yeah. and stuff and all the technology, yeah. having to make out that she could actually do yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> But you, you can sort of actually see how small she is in that job. Mm -hmm. She walks in in this suit and heels and you can see she's tiny, but she has this massive strength and power and you wouldn't mess with her. She's great in that role. She's bloody hilarious as well a lot of the time. Yeah. I get it. She's just a funny lady anyway, isn't she? Yeah. So we should also say at this point that her husband, Michael, who we've not really mentioned in this really, but yeah. they have a lovely relationship. They really do. Yeah. He gets very ill. Yeah. And he was misdiagnosed at first with pleurisy. Mm -hmm. and so his lung cancer was found too late and so he died and I was bracing myself for a terribly sad chapter or two and she just doesn't go there yeah. and that's fine yeah her trauma is humongous her grief will never leave her and I know that we don't need to read about it it's yeah. private 
I was surprised that he died so long ago, yeah, actually. Yeah, I remember it. In 2001. Mm. It's quite a private, public book, actually. Yeah, and I think if she hasn't talked about it in the book, then we shouldn't talk about it. No. Yeah. No. But she gets loads of other films. I mean, she's part of the f- film aristocracy at this point. She is now, she? yeah. All great films. All great yeah. films. It was um, The Shipping News, Importance of Being Earnest, and Iris. Iris, yeah, oh, I love massive that film. Hits. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember Importance of Being Earnest was being filmed when we lived in Ealing? Ah, was it? Yes, because they were filming at Walpole Park in the Walpole House. Some of the drama students then had seen them standing outside there in their, it was Rupert Everett and Judy Dent, yeah. in their full costume and stopped to talk to them. And they said, we're drama students just down the road. And Judy Dent and Rupert Everett said, oh, how lovely. Do you want us to come and talk to you all? We've, wow. we've got quite a while doing nothing. So they walked down in their costumes and went to Drama Studio London Did they? and talked to all the students. Pretty cool. Yeah. Then she gets a two-hander play with Maggie Smith called The Breath of Life. And she says they hadn't appeared on stage since they were at the Old Vic together. It's only 90 minutes long, but it was very intense. It was about two women, I think, who had the same man in their life. Anyway, it was a big success. And um, they got offered to take it to Broadway. I mean, what could be more amazing than Judy Dench and Maggie Smith on Broadway, a two-hander? Anyway, Judy Dench didn't want to take it, which upset Maggie Smith a lot. <laughs> Damn it. It would have been a massive hit. She's an Oscar-winning yeah. English actress on would Broadway. Have. It would have sold out. But she made a really big effort to hang about, to be there for her daughter. Her husband yeah. had just died. Fair enough. But when she was doing... Was it the shipping news then? She was with Kevin Spacey. Mm. They were having such a laugh. And it sounded like they had such a laugh when right when she needed it, when she was grieving. Yeah. And he took her to New York for the weekend, and they got mopeds and <laughs> razzed around Central Park. <laughs> She really got the hang of it and was off. So she's kind of, she's doing lots of different things at this point, isn't she? She did Merry Wives of Windsor back at Stratford, which I saw. It was a musical. Was it? Yeah, it was really fun. It was really good. I thought, oh, it's absolutely nuts to see Judi Dench in a Shakespeare musical. Yeah. I love how she talks about one of my biggest gripes about a theatre, a theatre goer. And I don't go that often anymore. In fact, I barely go at all because I think people have forgotten how to behave and it drives me Flipping crazy. What, like eating crisps? That people just can't sit and Chips. watch something in the theatre. And she actually goes into that in this book. And she mm. says that things are so distracting. She says the beep on digital watches. Yeah. She says it's really distracting to the point where she knows how quickly she's getting through something. Because she knows when it's beep, it's on the hour. Oh, my God, yeah. And then she's like, oh, I'm a bit behind tonight. Oh, but also how different the um, Broadway audience is to Britain. Because after she got famous in films, she gets standing ovation when she comes on. British audience never gives yeah. a standing ovation. It's just nothing. We just don't do that. And, and it does feel, when you read this book, of somebody who's really dedicated their life to their craft. It isn't like a starry book. It's very much a craft person who's honed it and does a job and serves a writer and serves yeah. the play. And the one thing I get from this book is, OK, you know, nice middle class family, she got to go to drama school. She got that amazing break at her showcase. But it's like she did not take any of that for granted. No. She really relished that opportunity. Okay, she was getting Shakespeare play after Shakespeare play, lead roles. Every single job, it's like she appreciated every single yeah. minute of it. I loved reading she, that. And, she really did, didn't she? Yeah, yeah, and her enthusiasm and then handing it on yeah. you know, to the yeah. next generation. Yeah. This book, for everything it misses out, and I understand why she's missed certain stuff out, there's a real love of theatre and, like you say, off stage craft. Yeah. And it was an it's easy... not indulgent. There's no swing pool, there's no yeah. fancy restaurant. She, she sometimes, when she's on Broadway, gets to have a bit of a show busy life going to a few restaurants, but that really is about the extent yeah. of it. She's a jobbing actor who's really yeah. famous. Yeah, she is. It's just she should just try to be a bit different sometimes. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Thrift Shop Biography. We love making this podcast and we're absolutely thrilled that so many of you are already listening. Um, We're new to this and you could really help us out by leaving us a review somewhere, wherever you listen to this podcast. 
And if you could share us, tell your friends about us or drop some links on social media. We have a Facebook page called Thrift Shop Biography. So make sure you come over there to hear about the episodes first and what else we're up to. Okay, see you next week. And if you're new here, there are loads more episodes now to go and listen in the back catalogue. So make sure you go and enjoy them. Okay, thank you very much.